Australia is witnessing the largest boom in coal and gas extraction the nation has ever seen. We're the second largest coal exporter on the planet and growing fast. There are plans for 65 new or expanded coal mines in Queensland and 27 in New South Wales, while the Victorian government has allocated another 13 billion tonnes of new coal in that state. Three new unconventional coal projects are proposed in South Australia and exports from Southwest WA are set to double. The first ever coal mine is slated for the Kimberley and the Northern Territory has plans for an underground coal gasification project. Climate change has been cast as an environmental problem. And while it is an environmental problem, it's also equally a problem for our health and our economy. While emissions from coal and gas are contributing to climate change, they're also affecting our health. In 2009, the international medical journal, The Lancet, said climate change was the biggest threat to global public health this century. Experts are concerned that these impacts will increase as the industry expands. GP Dr George Crisp has been reviewing the links between health and the environment for over a decade. Coal mining has a variety of health effects, both in communities where coal is mined, but also as a consequence of combustion of coal, mostly through air pollution from burning coal. While the health effects of coal and gas have been poorly researched in Australia, they've been well documented overseas. Associate Professor Ruth Collajuri recently reviewed the literature on coal mining and combustion. The most concerning impact is the excess deaths associated with coal mining for residents, local residents, and that includes death from lung cancer, from kidney disease and from heart disease. The major effects in coal mining communities relate to respiratory diseases and heart disease. There are also increased rates of high blood pressure and renal disease. In children particularly, there are greater rates of wheezing in coal mining communities, and there is evidence for low birth weight children and fetal abnormalities in those communities. The international evidence on coal-fired power shows different health effects to those of coal mining. The source of coal and the pollution controls at the power station also affect health outcomes. Some of this literature relates to a few studies in Europe and China, so it may be site-specific. Again, there were excess deaths, but they're from different causes. So there were deaths from um, laryngeal and bladder cancer in terms of diseases and illnesses, um, excess skin cancers, and that's uh, thought possibly to be due to the pollutants and uh, some of the arsenic that can be associated with coal-fired power stations. The effects in children are a little bit different, and again, always the respiratory disease, but there are also some quite alarming findings, like excess stillbirths, miscarriages, DNA damage, and something that can lead to cancer in later life. How serious is the impact of air pollution on health, and what does it tell us about the health risks associated with coal? We know quite a lot about air pollution and how it affects human health particularly cardiac and respiratory disease. And we know that coal mining and burning results in significant quantities of air pollutants, particularly gaseous compounds like sulphur dioxide and nitrous oxides, and also particulate matter. NOx and SOx are very irritating to the lungs, so it can exacerbate asthma, bring on coughs, make people feel pretty unwell. As a public health physician, Associate Professor Linda Selvey has a long-standing interest in the health effects of coal and climate change. Well, the toxins can attach to the particulates and when they're very small, that means they can get into the bloodstream and get carried to different organs in the body. The heart seems to be one of the most susceptible. We know that the very small particles that are emitted through particularly fossil fuel combustion deliver some of the toxic components that they carry, like hydrocarbons and heavy metals, deep into our lungs. We estimate that more people die from air pollution in Australia than Australia's road toll. The Australian Bureau of Statistics um, estimates that at least 2.1 or 2.2% of Australians actually die 
as a consequence of air pollution. What about the health risks to people who work in the industry? From an occupational health perspective, even in a country like Australia, which has really good occupational health and safety standards, mining and particularly coal mining is still one of the largest causes of occupational injury and death. Mercury is another pollutant produced by coal-fired power. Mercury from coal pollution enters the food chain via oceans and waterways. It's been found near coal-fired power stations in Australia, but despite this, the links are yet to be investigated. Well, for a number of years, mercury has been detected in both fish and sediment taken from some of the rivers in the Latrobe Valley, the Latrobe River and a number of other rivers and streams. Now, mercury doesn't happen naturally in that area. It has to have arrived there through some sort of pollution. Recently in Collier, a study demonstrated that there was mercury in the sediments in the local river system. And this requires further attention because we know that mercury, even at low levels in human populations, results in damage, particularly to fetuses and, and children. When you get a coal mine or introduction of coal mine or coal seam gas into an area, you get a significant increase in the number of trucks and other vehicles going between the mine, carrying coal or um, carrying people and other heavy machinery. Almost all of those are diesel trucks, and we know that diesel fumes are a carcinogen, so there's an important problem there with the diesel fumes. Coal transportation can go through towns where people are living, where they can be exposed to the coal dust, as well as the diesel from the transportation. In areas like the Hunter Valley, coal mines exist in closer proximity to communities and farmland than anywhere else in Australia. There are 34 coal mines and six coal-fired power stations in the Hunter. Newcastle is home to the largest coal export facility in the world. And if a fourth terminal is built, it will double capacity and triple the number of coal trains passing through the city. I think the big impact of mining, particularly coal mining and gas for that matter, is the, is the massive change in the landscape. And we're talking about some huge mines that mean large scarring of the landscape. So where people were previously surrounded by trees or green pastures and so on, seeing these huge um, scars is, is a big impact. And it's not to be dismissed, I don't think. And another part of that is that people don't necessarily have a choice on the fact that this is happening. The unconventional gas industry is expanding rapidly in Australia. Unconventional gas refers to natural gas resources trapped in coal, shale and tight sands. 408 million hectares of land is covered by gas exploration and production licences or applications. That's over half of Australia's land mass, an area 17 times the size of Great Britain. Dr Marion Lloyd-Smith is a leading Australian expert on the health effects of coal seam gas. One of the most common techniques for extracting unconventional gas is hydraulic fracturing or fracking. To fracture a seam, you basically pump in at very high pressure water, chemicals, radioactive traces and what are called propants. And they open up the cracks and let the gas run free. More than 500 chemicals are being used in the unconventional gas industry globally. Of the 23 commonly used in Australia, only two have been assessed in relation to health and neither for their use in hydraulic fracking. We have carcinogens, chemicals that can cause cancer. We have reproductive toxins. We have chemicals that affect neurological um, behaviour. We have chemicals that affect endocrine systems, our hormone systems. They are quite a nasty bunch. Yes, it's only 2% of the um, actual fluid that goes into the ground is made up of the chemicals, but that actually translates into anything up to 18 tonnes of chemical additive per frac per well. The wastewater that returns to the surface is contaminated with byproducts of the fracking process, and it's known as produce water. 
and that's usually collected and, and it must be treated because it's contaminated not only with the chemicals that are being used but with the chemicals that are naturally under the ground that come back with it. So things like benzene and toluene, um, naturally occurring radioactive materials, heavy metals and, and of course salt. And so then that must be managed as waste. Then that water is either released into a river or into um, natural streams, uh, some goes into municipal water supplies or is sold back to the farmers. But it is not totally clean. It still has a range of the chemicals that the industry uses that the technology cannot remove. Air pollution in the gas fields is another source of health concern. In the United States, a study was done where it looked at exposure of people living around a well and they found that those that lived within a half a mile of a well had a greater risk of neurological, respiratory problems and cancer over a lifetime. And it certainly has the industry worried and it certainly has us worried because many people live within a half a mile of a well in Australia. The community at Tara in Queensland are living in close proximity to gas wells. Brisbane GP Gerilyn McCarran has documented a variety of health impacts in the community. This includes skin, eye and nose irritation, nose bleeds, respiratory symptoms, difficulty breathing and neurological problems. We're particularly worried about the small children because, for example, we have kids that have got into the bath and come out with a rash on the lower half of their body, like a severe irritation and rash. We have kids who have nosebleeds. We have littleies who have got, you know, paresthesia, who are waking up in the middle of the night screaming because they've got pins and needles and horrible sensations in their hands and their feet. You know, some of the children have got discoloration around their nose and their mouth. These are serious symptoms. They're not the sort of thing that a parent just dismisses. And they are the type of symptoms that must be properly investigated. Coal and gas are major sources of greenhouse gas emissions. Our coal-fired electricity makes Australia one of the highest per capita emitters of carbon in the world. Galilee Basin in Queensland is one area of, of coal development, and if that resource alone was developed to its potential, it would result in annual emissions of over 700 million tonnes per annum. Put in context, Australia's current total emissions are about half of that, or 400 million tonnes per annum. Climate change is already having impacts on human health in Australia. We're seeing increasing rates of illness and deaths from heat extremes, and also impacts from extreme weather events, such as droughts and floods, and mental health consequences of those impacts. If Australia develops its remaining coal and gas resources, it will produce about 30% of the carbon required to push um, global temperatures past the supposedly safe two degree limit. A study in the American Economic Review found that the health costs of coal in America are greater than the value of the industry to the US economy. So what are the health costs here in Australia? Well, there's very little evidence about the health costs of the coal industry in Australia, except for one report which indicates that the health costs alone from generating coal-fired energy um, is $2.6 billion per year. 83% of the Australian mining industry is foreign-owned, so much of the income generated here is transferred offshore. The federal government annually spends $10 billion on subsidies to the coal, gas and petroleum industries. I don't believe that the coal industry is nearly as important to our economy as we're led to believe. The mining sector employs only 217,000 people and that's lower than the arts, uh, it's lower than local government um, and it's not very many jobs in a workforce of 11 million people. Given what the international literature tells us about the health impacts of coal and unconventional gas, what research are we doing here in Australia? There's very little research in Australia about the health impacts of either burning or extracting coal or coal seam gas. This is a real problem given that there is such a massive expansion in places where people live and we really don't know what the impacts are going to be. We, don't, we just don't have the evidence from Australia and I think that's a large part of the problem really that we can't make sensible decisions about policy about mining and regulations about mining because we actually don't know what it's doing to our communities. 
So we should really be moving towards renewable energy generation. We know that renewable energy is not just good for reducing our carbon emissions, but it also has significant health co-benefits and other environmental benefits too, in terms of reducing air pollution and water use and other pollutants into our environment. So what are the implications for unconventional gas? I think if a proper cost-benefit analysis was done of this industry, of the true cost of the waste, the cost to agriculture, the cost to community health, it would never be allowed to go ahead. Thank you.